welcome to the All Canadian Reptile Girl. I'm Annalise, at least according to my pilot's license, and I want you to imagine the biggest bird you have ever seen. Maybe it's a bald eagle, or a condor, or an albatross, just a big bird. Got it? Now I want you to imagine a pigeon, or a robin, or the regular sized bird of your choosing next to that giant bird. You with me? Okay, as small as your little bird is compared to your big bird is probably about how small your big bird is compared to the creature we will be talking about today, which happens to be the biggest living thing to ever fly. Let's meet Quetzalcoatlus. <laughs> joined with Oscar, who is not a Quetzalcoatlus. And this is not a Quetzalcoatlus. This is Hobbs, my Mackles Python. I debated on what animal I wanted in this video with me because I know who the real stars of my channel are. Initially, I thought Agatha, my redfoot tortoise, would be best as technically she is the most closely related animal I have to the Quetzalcoatlus. Surprising, I know. She doesn't really like being held for long periods of time though, and if I had her on the desk, I'd be spending the whole video keeping her from crashing onto the floor. So that wouldn't be good. And let's be honest, if there is an animal that is the antithesis of graceful flight, it's a tortoise. Then I thought maybe my crested gecko, she kind of leaps through the air, but she also does not like being held for long periods of time. And like Agatha, I'd be constantly trying to keep her from splooting to the ground. So I settled on Hobbs. He's arboreal and can reach the sky. That's almost like flying, right? Sure, I don't, I don't know. He's the best I've got and you guys love him because he's awesome. You also love him. He just shows up. <laughs> Anyways, neither of them are Quetzalcoatlus. But this is a Quetzalcoatlus. Well, this is not an actual Quetzalcoatlus. This is a toy, obviously. And if the YouTube channel Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong has taught me anything, is that this is probably inaccurate in a bunch of ways. To my untrained eye, I think that this is too lightly built in the arms and neck. Uh, the shape of the wings should be more rounded, though these points are kind of cool. Um, I don't know. The eyes might be too low or too far back. The beak should be curving down instead of this. What is this? Yeah. So there are probably a bunch more things wrong, but I don't know, that's just what I can see. I'm not a paleontologist, but even if it's not completely accurate, it's a pretty darn cool looking animal, especially when you consider the jaw dropping size these things attain. We'll get to that in a minute. With fossils first discovered in Texas in 1971, Quetzalcoatlus is a pterosaur, a long extinct group of flying reptiles. While they went extinct along with most of the dinosaurs more than 65 million years ago and often show up in dinosaur play kits, they are not dinosaurs themselves. They are archosaurs, the crown group of reptiles that includes crocodiles, birds, which are flying dinosaurs, and the rest of the dinosaurs that didn't evolve into birds. But pterosaurs themselves are not dinosaurs. That's okay though, they are super cool in their own right, being the first vertebrates that racked up enough XP to unlock the flying skill from the evolutionary skill tree. They ranged in size from the adorable sparrow-like nemicolopteryx that darted around eating insects to the gigantic Quetzalcoatlus that would eat, well not insects, I'll get to that in a minute too. First, let's talk about how huge these things were. There are two known species, Quetzalcoatlus lawsoni and the much bigger Quetzalcoatlus northropi, which is what we're talking about today. They weighed as much as a grizzly bear, between 200 and 250 kilograms, which sounds heavy, but when you consider that when not flying, these guys stood as tall as a giraffe, about five and a half meters, they're actually pretty light. The largest specimen discovered so far would have had a wingspan of almost 16 meters. On average, paleontologists estimate that 11 to 12 meters would probably be more of a typical size. That's still a bigger wingspan than an F-16 fighter jet. This animal was huge. So big, in fact, that for decades, paleontologists have been debating whether or not this thing could even get off the ground in the first place. And even those that were on the, look at the wings, this guy's got to fly camp, still struggle to find a good explanation as to how they did that. I'll get to that in a minute too. You'll remind me if I forget to circle back on any of these nuggets that I keep dropping, right? Thanks. They were up to 10 meters long from the needle-like tip of their three meter head to their adorable little toe toes. As you can see, they are very oddly proportioned. Like I said, I think that there were some inaccuracies here. I mean, the writing on the wing, come on. They did not have this in real life. 
but the general body proportions and ratios are pretty accurate as far as I can tell. With the gigantic head and the toothless beak, a lengthy and slender neck, that is about as long as their head, so about three meters. Some paleontologists think that pterosaurs may have used their neck, large head, and crest for steering and stabilization in flight, but there are also many pterosaurs with small heads and no crests, so maybe not. That kind of just sums up paleontology <laughs> really well. Their actual body is small, only about one and a half meters with spindly but surprisingly strong rear legs that are about two meters long. This model looks like it's actually covered in a feathery coating. This is accurate, although they weren't actually feathers. They were dense, hollow, hair-like structures called pycnofibers, which most of, if not all, pterosaurs had. This is actually a big piece of evidence towards them being warm-blooded, by the way, where fibers like these would be useful in retaining heat. So that's cool, or warm cozy really but it's the wings that really steal the show or should i say their hands which is what all this is most of it is just the pinky well not the pinky actually it's it would be the ring finger you know what i'm gonna explain that over there okay so this is where it gets a little weird we are going to pretend to be a quetzalcoatlus look at your hand now get rid of your pinky don't actually get rid of it just imagine it's not there. Your thumb, index, and middle finger are all normal reptile size fingers, if that's a thing, proportional to the rest of the animal. The fingers don't look freakishly big or undersized compared to how big you are as a Quetzalcoatlus. You with me? Okay, now your ring finger is where it gets a real wild. Were you a Quetzalcoatlus, your ring finger would be about yay big and a couple meters long. Your hand skin your hand skin would stretch down in this membranous flap that attaches here-ish. We don't know for sure if it attached down on the ankle, like with this model, or further up the leg, but it attached somewhere on the leg. And that's what we know. <laughs> Let me get resituated here. Either way, finding gloves that would fit would be impossible, but you could support your entire weight and flight on just your ring finger, so that's a pretty good trade, I think, and segues nicely into how the Quetzalcoatlus flew, which is not what we're talking about yet. I want to save that for the end, and there are a couple of other items I want to cover first. Initially, paleontologists speculated that they would have been scavengers like the modern marabou stork. In the 90s, that idea was rejected as the shape and curvature of their beak was not really suited for scavenging. Instead, it was suggested that they were skim feeders like the modern black skimmer, flying just above the water surface, opening wide and dragging their lower jaw through the water, scooping up any fish or small aquatic animals near the surface. Skim feeding became the commonly accepted way they fed, except there was no actual scientific study done to support that hypothesis. Hypothesis. It's like someone said, hey, I bet these guys are skim feeders. And then their buddy said, yep, works for me. How about we knock off early this weekend? And that was it for about a dozen years until someone actually did the math and realized that the huge amounts of drag produced by an animal that big skimming would make feeding that way impossible. So now the current line of thinking is that they were terrestrial hunters, much like today's herons, stomping along streams and waterways, picking off small animals with their long stabby beak small dinosaurs, fish, crustaceans, lizards, even early mammalian ancestors of ours could have been gobbled up by a hungry Quetzalcoatlus. How they would have walked as they hunted is kind of freaky, but even with their gigantic wings, they actually moved around pretty well on all fours. And we know this because we have fossilized tracks that show us how they stood, their gait, all that fun stuff. Most of the locomotion is driven by plantigrade walking on their back feet, plantigrade meaning walking on their feet like us, as opposed to digitigrade on their toes like a cat or a dog. Their front legs would rest with their pinky, sorry, ring finger pointing back and up, kind of folding their wing. When they walked, they would lift their forelimb out of the way, take a step with their rear leg, and then repeat it on the other side. Kind of awkward <laughs> looking waddly gait, but it did the trick. Fascinating, I know, but walking is not really what you want to hear about, is it? You want to know how they flew, right? Right, so I'll tell you. As I mentioned earlier, there was actually a lot of debate amongst paleontologists as to whether they could actually fly. And if they could, what kind of flyer were they? Thermal gliders, like an albatross, or flappy flappy fellas, like a pigeon? The main issue was their size and weight. How could something that big and heavy get off the ground and stay there? Well, like birds, Quetzi made use of hollow bones in their sack. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Did you say Quetzi? <laughs> I got so tired of typing out Quetzalcoatlus. There are just so many vowels. 
anyways. <laughs> Like birds, Quetzi made use of hollow bones and air sacs to reduce weight enough that their giant wings can generate sufficient lift to keep them aloft. However, getting up off the ground and airborne was still a mystery. One early hypothesis was, yes, I'm aware, my love. One early hypothesis was that they were cliff dwelling creatures that used gravity by leaping off the cliff to generate enough speed to hold the airfoils, their wings, aloft. The problem with this was that where we found fossils would not have been a very cliffy area. And even if it was, that still wouldn't provide sufficient speed. At their size, they would need a couple gravities worth of acceleration to keep from crashing. And the most you get when falling off a cliff or anything on earth at least is one G, so no help there. They needed to get themselves airborne. It took paleontologists, biomechanics, aerospace engineers, and mathematicians working together to figure out that they jump. <laughs> Seems pretty obvious and straightforward, right? Well, of course, there's more to it than you'd think. Let me ask you, how does a bird get off the ground? If you're like me, you'd probably have said that they flap their wings, right? And if you're like me, you'd be absolutely wrong about that. If you actually watch most birds take flight, you see that they point their wings straight up and actually jump with their powerful legs to get airborne. Then they start flapping. Some might run instead to get sufficient thrust on takeoff, but basically their takeoff equipment, legs, are a completely different system than their flying equipment, their wings. In most cases, 80 to 90% of their power on takeoff comes from their legs. Once they're airborne, the legs do nothing. It's all wings, baby. Pterosaurs aren't built like birds though, are they? No, no, they're not. Not really suited for generating a ton of power from their itty bitty hind legs, but you know what can generate a lot of power? Their huge front legs and folded wings. And because they get around on land quadrupedally, they can use all four limbs to generate the thrust they need to get airborne. And this is why the Quetzalcoatlus could get to, to such an enormous size far exceeding anything a bird could get to. By having separate mechanisms for getting off the ground and staying there, birds end up being limited in their max size. The bigger their flying muscles are, the more powerful their legs need to be to get them off the ground. The bigger the legs are, the bigger and stronger the flying muscles need to be in order to keep everything up in the air. At a certain size, a bird would either be too heavy to get into the air or too heavy to stay there. But if you combine the launching and flying muscles, you can get a lot bigger and generate the required lift you need to fly where you like. And this is how the Quetzalcoatlus do. We kind of get an idea of how this works by looking at how bats get airborne. They don't quite walk around the same way as a pterosaur, but they do walk quadrupedally and use all four limbs to get airborne. And just like a pterosaur, most of that thrust comes from the winged forelimbs. While bats kind of use all four legs at once to jump vertically upwards, pushing with powerful muscles, Quetzalcoatlus will kind of hunker down backwards on their back legs, loading them up, and also putting incredible tension on the flexor joints of their tendon of their ring finger joint. And then they vault themselves forward with their hind legs, shifting their center of gravity to the forelimbs. And it almost looks like they're going to face plant into the ground, but instead what happens when they hit that point is that the stored energy of the flexor ligament is suddenly released and the Quetzalcoatlus is catapulted into the air. They only need a couple of meters of clearance for them to start beating their wings with their powerful chest and arm muscles and start flying. How cool is that? Their morphology also presents some interesting puzzles on their aerodynamics once airborne. The shape of their wings was right, and there was more than enough real estate to generate enough lift to keep them up there. But with their giant head way out here and their tiny body in the back, they are front heavy and would be incredibly off balance. The presence of a pteroid bone solves that problem nicely and it actually looks like they've included it here on this guy. Though it would be pointing more straight forward and would most likely have a flap of skin that would connect up to the neck, but you know, at least they included it. This configuration would allow for variable geometry of their wings, creating a much broader forewing that helps compensate for the front heaviness and acts as a leading edge flap. Scale models tested in wind tunnels show that with the pteroid bone configured in this way, aerodynamic performance was greatly improved with exceptionally high lift capability and drag ratios, helping even the largest pterosaurs take off and land without difficulty. Some estimates have their max speeds up to 130 kilometers an hour, which is quite impressive, and also nowhere near fast enough for it to be able to keep up with and take down a cargo plane as depicted in the new Jurassic World movie, but as impossible as that scene would be, it was still really cool. Anyway, 
It was once thought that because of their size, they were likely thermal gliders soaring through the air with barely a flap of their wings for hundreds or thousands of kilometers, but more current models suggest that they were more active short range flyers. In either scenario, it would be incredible to see a creature like this take through the skies. Wouldn't you agree? As incredible as they were, they did not have the market cornered on giant pterosaurs. Transylvania's Hatsagoptrix and Cryodraken, the frozen dragon from Alberta, Canada, are more recently discovered giant pterosaurs that would have rivaled Quetzalcoatlus's immense size, which is so cool. The only thing cooler, in my opinion, would be these folks here. These are my patrons, and through their support, this video and others like it are possible. As a patron, you get early access to the videos, behind the scenes, and extra content, and more. If you are interested in supporting my channel, check out patreon.com slash allcanadianreptilegirl to see how you can help. Checking out the affiliate links in the description is another great way to help, as is hitting that like button and the subscribe button. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed learning about Quetzalcoatlus. This was a fascinating topic to research and I learned a ton. I have a bunch of other ideas for prehistoric reptiles. Let me know if this kind of content is stuff you'd want to see more of. Thank you all so much for watching and until next time, remember to nurture all nature. Bye! What? <laughs> His little hands are perfect for scooping out dirt from under your nails. Seriously? <laughs> well, because he's got little scoopers. I think they did this. Yeah, but there are others exactly like them who don't have that. So maybe not. Paleontology. I feel like it's a very frustrating career choice. I feel like we're not giving it its due respect right now. Oh, no, it's... I couldn't. But uh, I feel like paleontologists out there, you have a frustrating job, I think. Mm-hmm. Initially, paleontologists speculated that they would have been scavengers, like the modern marabou stork, although they hunted a lot too.